everybody on online. <laughs> nice to see you all here tonight. And uh, I don't see you there. I presumably you see us. And there's uh, some very nice people here. And uh, Scott and I just uh, had a nice supper. We we're talking about the Dharma. And I'm so pleased to have Scott Snibby here. You know, he has, maybe you all know who came, uh, that he has a marvelous, he was, he's an artist, right? You're an artist mm -hmm. originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he got all involved in Buddha Dharma, and he is very, very knowledgeable. On that. And also, he's very knowledgeable about science. And also, he's a skeptic. So he's not just a, a, devo a devotional fanatic. He is a... <laughs> uses reason to understand things, and uh, he felt that, uh, I think, I feel a driving motive of the book is that he wanted people to know that, that um, the tradition is there to help people cultivate their mind to ch so, that, so that meditation is part of how to change the way you live, not just a place you retreat to, something like that. You know, and it isn't just emptying the mind, it's actually cultivating and reshaping the mind and so on. So I think, and that is the poor specialty of Tibetan tradition. And, uh, and this book, How to Train a Happy Mind, and the, the poster for this book, I think is wonderful. I really like it. I kept thinking to myself, one person whose mind was happy is the person holding up the book. <laughs> <laughs> because his smile is so wonderful, I think it's really marvelous. And uh, <clears throat> I was on his podcast, his skeptic podcast, uh, a couple of times, I think. Once yeah, by yeah. myself and once with Kim Stanley Robinson, wonderful person, Scott arranged. They had a dialogue. And um, so I'm very fond of it. And um, he's even interested in helping Tibet House in the West Coast and here and there or wherever and online. So I'm just thrilled that he's traveling, he's doing a book tour. But if some of you are writers, you may know that since uh, some period of time, I think maybe since Amazon, book companies almost don't send you on book tours unless you're Hillary Clinton or you're so, so famous that you know everybody knows you or something. Otherwise, they don't send you around to do book tours. So Scott has entrepreneurially organized to do book tours in a number of places. I think he's done a wonderful job. Yeah, yeah. And um, we are very honored to have him here at Tibet House. So thank you very much for being here. And now I will turn it over to Scott about to, to tell us uh, how you, what you've been doing and how you came to write this book and what your hopes are for it and maybe reading something from it. Yeah, if sure. If you'd like to do that. Sure. And did you want me to, that equanimity section maybe? What's that? Do you want me to read that equanimity section perhaps? Well, for or? example, that would be a good passage. Yeah. But... Uh, there's another. Yeah, whatever. <clears throat> There's actually a I nice think he's, one. He's got special excellence that I think in the book. I read most of it. And I think one of his uh, excellences is how he <clears throat> articulates the different Tibetan um, shapings of the mind. Uh, he articulates them in a way that interacts very, very strongly and forcefully with our current situation. So it, it isn't like we're just sort of going to Tibet or something. It's like he brings Tibet into our lives in a certain way. Mm. So this, I think, is really like he ha anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Entertainment as a refuge, for example. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think it's very, you know, it's very wonderful. Well, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about the book for, for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, in this, in the Tibetan tradition, the foundation of the practice, um, certainly at the beginning, is something called the Lam Rim, which uh -huh. means the stages of the path. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was um, created about a thousand years ago by a Tisha. Stay close to the mic. Yeah, yeah it was created about a thousand years ago by a Tisha, and then revised about 500 years ago mm -hmm. by Lama Tsongkhapa. And actually, that's actually a part I would like to read, because I I spent some time trying to make the Lam Rim sound very exciting and tasty right on the sixth page. So maybe I'll just read that one paragraph and then talk a little bit more because that's the basis. But the thing about the Lam Rim is that 
it's steeped in the culture of uh, of Tibet of Tibetan and India. It's really Tibetan Buddhism is really Indian Buddhism. You know, it started at Nalanda University, this particular tradition, and it's a tradition that really relies deeply on critical analysis and also a type of meditation called analytical meditation, which is for people less familiar with this tradition, it's almost the opposite of what you think meditation is because we're used to mindfulness mm -hmm. meditation, which is um, a type of meditation where you cultivate concentration and focus and you become less reactive. You can let things just pass through your mind, you know, so it's very beneficial. But mindfulness doesn't necessarily tell you what to fill your mind <laughs> with. It helps you to let things pass through your mind. But analytical meditation deliberately cultivates things that to put in your mind. One definition of meditation is um, bringing out your best qualities, uh -huh. right? A way of, of not just concentrating, but concentrating on virtue. What we uh -huh. say. And so that's what I wanted to get at is there have been very few books for a non-Buddhist that explain this other type of meditation. And in many ways, it's an easier meditation for, you know, very active, you know, Western minds to cultivate because it's like a story. Each of the meditations is like a story. You tell yourself to bring out a, spe a specific quality like love, compassion, patience, generosity, uh, recognizing impermanence. Um, I like to I like to add humor <laughs> also as one of the yes the you do you do <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but I'll read let me read this one paragraph about the Lam Rim because it I think it's quite nice um, a, a, a nice summary that I, I actually added kind of late okay. in the book to be sort of tasty it's on page six so the Lam Rim is a masterwork of metaphysics and moral philosophy that says nothing is random. Everything, both material and mental, has a cause, and the mind works according to habit. So positive thoughts result in increments of happiness, while negative ones lead to increments of unhappiness. The Lam Rim says that life is immeasurably precious, everything is constantly changing, and the universe is a miraculous, interdependent continuum of which we are an integral part. From practical mental habits to defensible universal laws, the Lam Rim gives us a path to transform our sadness, anger, and loneliness into happiness, compassion, and connection. So that's to get, that's sometimes, once, many of my teachers say this form of Buddhism is tasty. It's something when you hear about it, you really want to learn more and you really want to practice it. So I wanted to give a little a flavor of the, the, the tastiness to start. But the issue with the Lam Rim is it was developed in a culture that took um, past and future lives, karma, and other realms of existence, like literal hell and God realms. Um, from birth, people born into the culture take those as givens. And our culture doesn't accept those things. And I don't even take a position in the book as to whether those are true. It's just that I tried to write a book for people who don't believe those things. How can you practice this path as authentically as possible if you don't believe those things? I'm not trying to prove they're right or wrong in this book. And so that's what it is. It tries to, to hone authentically, as authentically as possible to the Lam Rim, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. recommends, like in his book Beyond Religion. He is kind of a manifesto for people like me and, and, and others to try to make you know 10,000 versions of this to you know, share the Buddha Dharma in a form that uh, is secular, you know. And there's one more quote right at the, the, the in the very first page. I quote Geshe Namdak, who's a okay. Western Geshe, what and he says, say? he says, he um, says, yeah, you can just go to page one or whatever. And oh yeah, it's and, the right. And, really. and he said, no. Buddhism is not meant to make more Buddhists, but to generate happy minds. So. <laughs> That's really good. So that's what you're doing, whether you're following your teacher's instructions there. I also like very much how you, you mentioned where His Holiness, you were so shocked when you first ho ho went to His Holiness on the next page here. You say, with the Dalai Lama, he, in the beginning of a lecture, he said, don't be a Buddhist, right? He, he said, um, <clears throat> he doesn't want to make anybody into a Buddhist. 
don't become a Buddhist. That's right. You said one of the first things Dalai Lama said at the start of his five days of Buddhist teachings was, don't become a Buddhist. <laughs> what do you think of that? What do you think about that? I like that actually very much. Actually, well, but one time he was giving a lecture where I was present, and he was saying this, and he recently, and there's a film where it's the biography of David Bohm, the, the physicist, with whom His Holiness had many conversations over the years. And I was present some of them, in some meals with him and his wife, and meeting with His Holiness, during some meals and so on. So I sort of knew that, and I was very impressed. And anyway, he's talking about that, but then at one point he really draws himself up, and he says, I wanted to be clear that in all of my time teaching and lecturing all over the world, I have never given a teaching to people who were not born Buddhist with the motivation of making them become a Buddhist. He says that. Mm -hmm. Which I, and I, really, I really love that. I think that's quite wonderful. And, um, and I think you are fulfilling that very well. You were saying that you're saying you're not trying to make, you want everybody to be a skeptic, right? Yeah. But, but that means, so you're saying that, and that's what Geshe Namdai wants. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What will, would you think being a skeptic will make people happy? <laughs> Why will that make them happy? Well, it's the right type of skeptic. So I think a lot of people think a skeptic is a cynic. So that a skeptic is someone who outright rejects anything. However, the, if you look up skepticism and you look at the, like the, the, the Western Enlightenment roots yes. of the term skepticism, Yes. is actually an openness. It yes. starts with openness, to be yes. absolutely open and curious to everything, but to test it. Yeah. You know? And that's where there's this incredible overlap with Buddhism, because the Buddha himself said, there's this famous uh, you know, statement the Buddha made, he said, don't trust anything I say. He said, I'm paraphrasing obviously, um, test it like gold. He said, bite it. There were these old fashioned ways of testing gold. You say, bite it, scratch it, mm -hmm. rub it, et cetera, weigh it, etc. And that I found really compelling too, because, and I heard that the first time I saw His Holiness, because His Holiness seemed to say the Buddha himself was a skeptic. Mm -hmm. Not only did he was skeptical about the teachings of his time, oh, and definitely. made some extraordinary <clears throat> revelations, especially he revealed that asceticism was not the path to ultimate enlightenment, yes. among other things. And, um, and then he also asked his own followers to be skeptics, which is extraordinary to say, don't trust anything I say, you have to validate it yourself. And we were talking about this beforehand, but there's Thupten Jinpa recent, Thupten Jinpa, who is a Dalai Lama's translator, extraordinary scholar himself, he actually says there's two types of science. One type is uh, the controlled experiment, like the modern type of science where you use a controlled experiment, external validation instruments, to prove, you know, uh, mod ch just change one variable and determine some type of truth. The other, Jinpala says, is um, reproducibility. So it's the more general idea of science that's existed for thousands of years, that if you can uh, demonstrate something to, that someone else can reproduce independently, then that's also a form of science. And that's, and that's what, you know, this book tries to do, because a very, very small portion of Buddhist practice has been validated scientifically, very tiny, but all of it has been subjectively validated by individuals over the course of, you know, 2,500 years. years. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Stage six, the red pill of renunciation. Yeah. <laughs> you want to read some of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, Page um, one. 35. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this, is a, this is an interesting um, chapter. Other people have written about the, in the matrix. And so this is a little bit, let me see how much of this should I read. Um, I love it. I'll, I'll start, I'll read a little bit of it and then I may kind of move into summary, but there is an, uh, this is a good place to read. There had to be a point in this book where I would bring up the matrix. A classic cyberpunk film famous for exploring the nature of reality and the power of delusions. After meditating on suffering, there comes a profound turning point on the Buddhist path 
where you decide which direction you want your life to take toward a continued pursuit of worldly happiness outside yourself or toward an inner source of happiness that relies more on your mind. Metaphorically, you take the red pill or the blue pill, the choice Morpheus offered Neo in the Matrix. And so I'll skip the look, I summarize that scene for people who no, haven't no, no, seen, no, 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 read the whole thing, okay. For anyone who hasn't seen the movie, its hero, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, is a small time hacker who meets a mysterious figure named Morpheus. In the movie's most famous sequence, Morpheus tells Neo that everything about the world he lives in is a lie, a collective delusion that somehow exists only in his mind. Morpheus gives Neo the choice of taking a red pill or the blue pill. Uh, uh, oh, Morpheus gives Neo the choice of taking a red pill that will reveal the true nature of reality or a blue pill which will return him to his dreary life. Neo decides to take the red pill. What follows is one of the greatest reveals in the history of cinema, where all that Neo thought was reality turns out to be, spoiler alert, a computer simulation run by robot overlords to enslave humanity. So the choice, the choice Neo makes between the red pill and the blue pill is a powerful metaphor for the choice we make to either continue blaming our suffering on external events unwillingly imposed on us or face up to the true sources of suffering, our delusions of attachment, anger, and ignorance. I love that. Thank you. That's so, great. I always refer to the Matrix. I hope you've both seen the Matrix. If you haven't, it's homework <laughs> for Buddhist studies. It's so wonderful. And um, uh, I always use it. Also. So I'm so happy to see that, how you do. I think you used it really well. I think that's very really great. Yeah, but I use it for mm. renunciation instead of for um, you know emptiness. Right. To say that um, because that's the thing. What is it that you renounce? You know, and renunciation sounds quite masochistic. It's the point where you start to realize you can't be satisfied um, by you know nice meals. Um, money, uh, even a nice relationship with your partner, that all of them, they, they lack a permanent ability to satisfy you that um, for many different reasons, most of all, because they don't, they don't last. Mm -hmm. And so how do you find a lasting <clears throat> form of satisfaction in this form, in our form of Buddhism, you know, that comes from Tibetan Buddhism, um, renunciation doesn't mean giving up, you know, ice cream or even, you know, making love with your partner. It means giving up attachment, anger, and ignorance. So it's those, the way your mind gets very, very tightly um, thinking that something external outside of yourself, if you get it, it'll make you happy. Or that if only that thing would stop happening right now, which there's a lot of things we can think of right now, we'd like to stop right now. If only that one thing would stop, we'd be happy. Um, those, it turns out that that's not true. Even if you get those things, and even if the thing stops, something else comes along. So you need some internal way to be happy, and that's to you know, give up those delusions and start to look at the impermanent continuity of existence, mm -hmm. and also your interdependence, that you're not separate mm -hmm. from the world and, the, and nature itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it took, it took me a long time to realize, maybe 20, more than 20 or 30 years, that renunciation, we all are afraid of renunciation in our culture. We think that people are really being hard on themselves when they renounce things. And it, it took me, and I was even, I, I was determined to be a monk when I was first encountered Buddhism. And then I was that for a few years, and then I resigned from that and so on. But I, I don't think I really understood what I was doing, but basically it's a way of, <clears throat> of reordering one's priorities. Right? Deciding that there's some higher type of of uh, success rather than just accumulating things that that don't uh, don't ultimately have meaning. I think. Yeah. Don't you think? So it's actually rewarding yourself. Certainly, in the you know people are always surprised about Tibetan monks. Actually, we have a wonderful geshe yeah. Thank you. The reason that <laughs> that uh, uh, Scott and I are wearing this uh, Kadak Tibetan scarves is this very nice geshe from the Sera Monastery. <laughs> Uh, visiting this evening, and he gave them to us on our way in. <laughs> Usually, when you meet someone, you give them a white scarf, yeah. which symbolizes uh, sort of you, the openness of your mind. Yeah. 
and uh, your good your good intention and goodwill about the other person. It's like a thing like that. I think it comes from ancient Indian social thing. When someone visits, you offer them a towel, offer them water to wash their face and rinse their mouth, and then a towel to dry like that. It's a, offer them a cloth. I think it comes from that. But something Tibetans do. Mm. That's very, not very nice. Thank you, guys. Really, Thank very you. nice. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. sure. I couldn't hear. It, he wants to say something in. Uh, well, may, maybe English, because I think Bob can't hear you. So maybe yeah, I have trouble all. hearing. So if you say in English, then yeah. <laughs> Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> Renunciation. No. No. Renunciation. Renouncing, right? If you want to get a mind, wishing. Wishing, mind of wishing, oneself to get free from the suffering, also suffering. Yeah, yeah, so you're saying, this is a great point. So um, Geshe is saying that in Tibetan, renunciation means wishing yourself to be oh, yeah, free yeah. from suffering. So this is, this is, and it's causes. So this is a really important point that I talk about here because mm -hmm. normally in the Buddhist path, the, the term self-compassion doesn't appear, but we talk about it a lot, like especially in the West, because we, this was something that was new to Tibetans when they, you know, when Tibetan Buddhism first encountered the West, is that uh, Westerners had so much, such a sense of self-loathing um, kind of self-hatred even. And so um, I asked my different teachers, as I was thinking about this, like where does self-compassion occur on the path? And then I thought, oh yeah, it's in renunciation. Yeah, because course. you're finally thinking, what are the real causes of happiness and suffering? And how do I cultivate the cause of happiness and let go of the causes of suffering? And then I asked my teacher to confirm, and yeah, um, Lauren Ladner, and it's Venwal Sangye Kadro. They both said the same. They both yeah. said the same thing. It also can be called the determination to be free. So it's not at all masochistic. And in Mahayana Buddhism, it doesn't ask you to give up nice things in life. It just asks you to give up the attachment to them. And then, strangely, you enjoy them more. Yeah. You know, you can enjoy a meal. You can enjoy a walk outside. You can enjoy, you know, a kiss from your partner much yeah. more when you see it more fully. That it's impermanent. That and it could be the last time, <laughs> you know, it might be the last nice sushi meal you have, like we just had or the kiss from your partner. And it doesn't make you neurotic. You actually, because that's just the truth. It's just mm -hmm. the truth. The Buddha didn't call his teaching Buddhism. And that would have been a bit egotistic, right? He called it the Dharma, which is just the, the truth. You can explain it yeah. better than I can, Bob, but it's, it's the truth. It's a truth. It's a provable truth, right? Yes, actually, and the Western words for monasticism don't fit well with the Tibetan thing. Mm -hmm. Like we use the word ordination when you become a monk. Mm -hmm. But in the Tibetan, the word is more like graduation. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're really escaping from taxes, paying tuition for children, raising a family, <laughs> uh, fighting in the military, doing all social duties, you know. Yeah. You, you, are, you are exonerated from all of these things, and the society lifts you up to seek a higher purpose of developing yourself and yeah. educating yourself in a certain way. Yeah. So the, the language for, uh, you know, I think we expect in, in our Western society, Protestant ethic, you have to be productive to be, or you're worthless. The idea that someone who dropped out of all of those kind of socially imposed things, like tiger mom, mm -hmm. if you're the child of a tiger mom, you have to start getting ready for Yale at the age of three. You know? <laughs> And then what are you going to do, be a lawyer, or you're going to be do this and do that? And uh, actually, more suffering, I think, really, yeah. rather than, than more becoming a, a more appreciative of life and being more friendly and better to other beings. You, there's no such idea. Uh, but, but in the Asian society, like India and Tibet and other places where they have this idea that the human being has these higher capacities yeah. that you can cultivate, I think they, they see it, they've seen our renunciation as a self-reward. Yeah. As yeah. a privilege, actually. Yeah. 
and actually more than men, women. You know, like Buddha, uh, historically, uh, Buddha is accused by modern feminists, tends to be feminist academics, of being, of being a male chauvinist himself, because he, twice he sort of said, no, we don't need to have female monastics, we don't need nuns. <laughs> Two times, he said. Then his foster mother and his ex-wife insisted, and they walked barefooted to his thing. And then his nephew went to him and said, look, you really have to let them, if they want to, come on, you owe them this privilege, you know? And so he said, well, okay. Uh, and, and actually he said, the reason I was hesitant, and he put some other things to make it a little less um, privileged than the males. So that, because he was scared that they would themselves seek that privilege in huge numbers, and they did. It was like a stampede, because the patriarchal family system in India at that time, as I think, which is not a mystery to us, I think we still have, we still didn't sign the ERA even in America, they were doing all the work, mm -hmm. you know? So the women were more ready to reward themselves with a, a life of education and this and that, you know. I'll never forget the one woman who wrote this poem. Oh, but I really like you, thank you. I just had lunch. I begged the lunch, I didn't have to cook it. <laughs> and I don't have to wash the dishes, I only have the yeah. one bowl, I, I creamed it out, yeah. put it in my, in my little sack. And I'm um, sitting under the tree and I had this free lunch. I'm so grateful to you, Buddha, you liberated me from three crooked things. You raised me from my crooked rice pestle pounding thing for husking the rice, from my mother-in-law, my bent over mm -hmm. old mother-in-law who used to scold me all the time about everything, and from my hunchback husband. <laughs> if this isn't nirvana, it's good enough. <laughs> she said. So I think that we see that in the history of it anyway. I'm just yeah. adding that to the thing, you know. But uh, I think you, you are offering, you are giving the fruits of this to the people in our current cultural setting that is so great, I think, really. Red pill, absolutely. Red pill, I love it. The four facts. Oh, you're calling the four truths the four facts. I love that. Well, that I got from you, Bob. I mean, that, what? that was from you. You that you call them. So there's these what they call the four noble truths, which was the Buddha's first teaching. But right. in, but in the Lamrim, it comes later because that's the that's the famous teaching that that life is suffering, which is not a, a good translation. Um, it's more like life is unsatisfactory. You know, this is a place we disagree with Stephen Batchelor sometimes, but he translates the first of these four facts. As embrace life, as, well, right? as embrace life, embrace life, which is actually quite quite beautiful and maybe a little controversial. But the idea of this it first, is rather yeah, but this first fact is just that things are unsatisfactory. Nothing satisfies you. Nothing satisfies yes. you permanently. Um, well, the unenlightened but, life. The point is, yeah. you know, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. But Buddha didn't say that. Buddha said, the unenlightened life will be stressful. That's what he said, basically, I think. And, um, but he didn't offer that you shouldn't live it. He, you know, it's a human, especially human life. What about the precious human life? Tell us about that or so, read us about yeah, it. Yeah, so. Read to us that about was that. The, that was the most, okay, yeah, I, can, I know a good place for that. That was the most difficult topic to translate because the normal teaching on the precious human life is that um, you've had infinite past and future lives. Um, so I was invited to teach the Lam Rim um, at, at meditations about 18 years ago. And trying to teach the subject was what convinced me that a book like this needed to exist. Because in that topic, we were inviting people in who were non-Buddhists and say, anyone come to the Buddhist center, we'll teach you this sequence. Um, it's for you know secular people. But then we'd say, this precious human life topic, we'd say for infinite past and future lives, you've been a turtle, a ghost, <laughs> a god, finally you're human, but watch out, you're burning up your karma, and you know, you better, you better make sure you, you create good karma in this life so that you have a better rebirth. 
and don't end up in a hell realm and so on. So in one sentence, it takes all of the aspects of Buddhism that most Westerners would consider supernatural and, give, and it mm -hmm. gives, takes them as givens. So with this topic, what I tried to do was two things. One, there's two quotes actually. One was um, when I was young, when I was in college, I once read this quote by Voltaire and he said, it's no more surprising to ha live two lives than one, <laughs> right? So this, this Buddhist, I'm sorry, what did he, say? he said, it's no more surprising to live two lives oh. than one. And so that I thought was a nice basis for the, mm -hmm. that. It's, yeah. it's so extraordinary to exist at all. And so I ground the precious life in, in general in that idea. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh says, you know, we have 24 new precious hours, new, 24 new hours to live. What a precious gift. So part of it is very practical. And then the second part of the precious life is very cosmic, but in a, but in a scientific way, cosmological. And so I was, really, uh, moved, I was really moved by Carl Sagan when I was a kid, when I saw Cosmos, that was my introduction. Yeah, Sagan, right. Yeah, Carl Sagan. Well. So that's the second <sighs> part of the precious life meditation is how do you replace the awe that a Buddhist feels in the face of infinite lives with the awe in a, in a current modern world? And for me, that's by looking at the actual history of the universe as we understand it. So the universe has existed for 14 billion years. It's only the, the, the last 200,000 years that humans have existed maybe we are the only for all we know we're the only beings in the universe that can reflect back and understand it you know like carl sagan said we are a way for the cosmos to understand itself so that's the that's the way that i add that op portion that a buddhist would feel in the face of infinite lives is to feel it in the almost infinite span of time and with us at that tip of history, think about this. You're supposed to do this meditation every day when you wake up in the morning. And so on the one, think about all the universe leading up to you waking up in as a sentient, aware being. What are you going to do with your day? Right? We, what if we're the only conscious, compassionate, self-aware beings capable of like understanding the universe and our minds? What do you want to do with your day? Do you want to start scrolling Instagram and binge watch Netflix? Or, you know, are there other things you know, we should do? Quite beautiful, your paragraph. Why don't you read it? On oh, which one is that? 70. 70? The scientific miracle of Oh, life. yeah, that's a good one. Okay. 70. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Now contemplate your connection to the universe. You sit in the center of a universe 13.8 billion years old with 100 billion galaxies. There are at least 100 billion planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. An estimated 100 million of them with rocky planets like ours, circling their own burning star. One of them is our own sun, 4.5 billion years old, where life on its third planet, the Earth, has existed for at least 3 billion years. Over that time, the scientific magic of evolution transformed simple chemicals into cells, worms, fish, snakes, dinosaurs, mammals, and monkeys. Humanity arrives at the tip of history only 200,000 years ago. Some 10,000 generations of humans pass by, so many of them struggling, dying at birth, hungry, violent, afraid and then you are born. Now, despite its drawbacks, discomforts, and injustices, you are lucky enough to live in a world that is safer and more abundant for humans than it has ever been before. There's no evidence yet for any other life in the universe. What if humanity is the pinnacle of cosmic evolution, the sole way for the universe to know itself? If being intelligent and self-aware is unfathomably rare and precious, how should you spend your day? What's the best way to achieve a happy mind and to live with dignity, meaning, and connection? It may be nothing more than what you're doing right now, going inward, probing your mind, cultivating the true causes of happiness in the present moment through gratitude and self-awareness. Soon you'll go out into your day to deepen your connections with others and make our fragile, beautiful world 
a little bit better for everyone else who shares it. Rest in these thoughts for a minute. In your profound connection to all the universe and all of history, your gratefulness for being alive. How will you make the most of this day? My friend had me lead that meditation at her birthday, <laughs> which was nice. It was the first birth meditation at a birthday party. She said, you know, I don't just want to have a party. I, I want people to really think about their lives. And, and so she said, would you, read this would you lead this meditation at my birthday party? So I did, and she has a you lot. You read this particular one? Yeah, I, I mean, I it's guided really nice. it. It was before I read this, but it's the same uh -huh. meditation. And um, I led it. And then some people came up to me afterwards, some of her friends, because many people had never meditated, you know, certainly not med analytical meditation or this type of meditation. And a few people came up to me and they said, I'm thinking of making some big changes in my life. You know? <laughs> really? Like if, if you really do these meditations sincerely, um, it makes you really reconsider you know, yeah. how to live your life. And it might not change anything external, but the way you feel inside and how you approach you know, your family, your relationships, your job. It's quite lovely. I love it. Thanks, thanks for really thanks for having nice. me read that. That's that's a good one. It's quite nice. How about let's, what's next? Embracing impermanence. How do we do that? Well, um, impermanence. The the idea of impermanence is is just a, okay. I'm going to tell a, a different story about this because okay. I have a, I have a friend who well, unless you want me to read a part of it, but I have a friend who's a professor. Okay. Um, and he's um, he has he knows so many people. He's such such a sophisticated individual. He's uh, like sixty years old. And he asked me about my book. We were at, we were at a party, and and I told him about it. And they said, "Oh, what's one of the topics then? There's, there's all these topics. What's one of them?" And I said, "Okay, this is the topic I usually start with, with for someone who's never heard of it: impermanence." I said, "Look at that house over there. We're looking on a hill." I said, "When you look at that house." It appears as if it's always been there to your mind, like, but it was planned, it was paid for, someone you know, bought the land, cleared the land, it, it took years to develop and probably hundreds of people involved. So it began at some point, and then it's going to come down, and it might be an earthquake, we live in California, so it might be an earthquake tomorrow, it might be the last house standing here in hundreds of years. So, so that's impermanence to not just see the object as it looks now, but the arc. And then I said, the really powerful thing is to look at people that way. So when I look at, let's look at each of you in the audience, when you look at someone, think they look kind of permanent as if they've always been that way. And if you're annoyed by them, like your boss yelling at you, it's really like they've always been that way. They've always been annoying. They drive you crazy. It's never going to change. <laughs> but what you think as you look at that person is that person was born. And think of it very graphically. I actually think of them, you know, sliding out. A lot of us have seen a real birth, you know, if we're, for parents, or if you watch a documentary. Think of them sliding out of their mother, and the mother, you know, that profound moment, maybe a very painful moment, and also maybe the most profound moment of her life. And then think of that the person will eventually die. Um, it might be tomorrow. It might be after they're yelling at you uh, in the office. They'll walk right out. Or it might be after 20, 30, 40 years surrounded by friends or or alone. So to see everyone that way, especially in New York, because people really seal themselves off. But as you walk down the sidewalk in New York, try to see people that way. Wow, that person, every one of those person was born, and every one of those person will die. And what I say in here is that everyone walks the hero's journey. You know, everyone, what, what, everyone walks the hero's journey. Oh, yeah, yeah. That everyone's life has that incredible arc of a hero mm -hmm. from, from birth to death. And we're each somewhere in between like so to see everyone that way it really opens up your heart it makes it very very difficult to see someone as either a strong enemy who's driving you crazy or this you know object that if only you get them or, or get something from them that you'll be happy oh yes you discuss about the 9-11 yeah what he talked about impermanence Yeah, that was the first time I got that t 
teaching was from what that that was the first time I got that teaching from Geshe Geshe Sulga was my brother my brother got me into Buddhism and his teacher Geshe Sulga I was at uh, I had just become a Buddhist and I was in Boston and 9 11 mm -hmm. occurred in fact we were scheduled on the same flight the next day to, to New York City really so really? yeah really so um Geshe Sulga gave a talk I, I write about it in the book but Geshe Sulga gave a talk that day and I was really surprised because he didn't talk about mindfulness or compassion or even compassion, although he was obviously compassionate, but he talked about impermanence. He said, you know, you people really need to get into your heads. You all of us thought that building was going to be standing today. There's not one person here who had any idea. If, if you're honest, you thought those buildings would stand for hundreds of years or, or permanently. And yet they fell yesterday. And he said the most important lesson from that day beyond feeling compassion, which we really want to do for all the people that died and their loved ones, is to get it really ground into our skulls that everything is impermanent. And that if you really, really feel that, if you get what's called a realization, which is not an impossible thing to get with the Lam Rim, you can get these some of the Lam Rim realizations with a, you know, a, a month of more intensive meditation, mm -hmm. you know, not not the later ones, but mm -hmm. certain ones like impermanence. And that starts to infuse your whole life with a, you know, more of a sense of um, both urgency and compassion, because you realize you know, things don't last. Amazing. Meditation on impermanence of the body, impermanence of the mind, mm -hmm. impermanence of the outer world. You were also talking about equanimity when we were, um, you were talking about equanimity, the equanimity as a human right, you know, yes, that, that's, yes. that struck you from the book. Yes. Where, where, where was that equanimity? I forgot which page. That's later. So that's in, you know, in the, in the Buddhist path, like compassion comes at the end because it's, it's difficult actually. It's quite difficult. Um, yeah. So it's like 150 something. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that was one you were interested in. Um, because we hear about love and compassion, um, but it, they're actually quite difficult. So yeah, there was this part I think Bob wanted me to write. Wanted me, oh yeah, equanimity as a 165, I think you were saying. Okay, 155? 165, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we hear about love and compassion a lot, but there's actually this practice that comes before that, which is equanimity, which is kind of like um, when a painter primes their canvas, you know, you first have to put, put these special materials on it that make it allow any color to seep into it. And so Bob was telling, before, we, um, before this, Bob was telling me he liked this idea as equanimity as a human right. Yes, well, why don't you do it in the context of the four immeasurables first? And then, and then, uh, and then come to the equanimity. Yeah, yeah. So I can explain that for people. Yeah. So and to lead us through the four immeasurables. Okay, I'll do my best. So there's an incredible practice. This stage of the path is um, when you ex really expand your heart, and that's and we start with that. Actually, this is one of the things I talk about in the book. In Mahayana Buddhism, they say it's very important to color your meditation with a wish to benefit others. You know, so even though it comes later in the path, these ideas about love and compassion, you actually want to color every single meditation um, with them from the beginning. So one quick way to do that, they once you know them, is these four steps, these four immeasurables, and it's immeasurable love, uh, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable you know equanimity, immeasurable joy, and they come in different orders depending on you know on the text. But what I loved about Buddhism is that. It's very difficult to, to define love in, uh, you know, from a Western perspective. It seems very wrapped up with, a with attention, with a uh, attachment, wanting, wanting something mm -hmm. from other people. But in Buddhism, love is, is, has a very simple definition, which is wanting others to be happy. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so, but there's this incredible expanse of love that you call, you know, great love or immeasurable love, which is um, wanting everyone to be happy. So again, this is one of these practices you can also do every day. And they say at the beginning of you know, every practice is um, may all beings be 
happy, <laughs> you know, whatever that, whatever that means. And you can think of it in every single way. You can imagine um, freeing everyone from war and violence and offering everyone food um, and so on. And then the next one is compassion. So wishing pe compassion is wishing others not to suffer, to take away their suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And then equanimity is evening the canvas. It's it's actually seeing that all those all your relationships are changeable, that you're actually quite biased, that you mostly feel love to the people very close to you, and you feel um, negativity, you know, towards your towards your enemies. So in the equanimity meditation, you try to think about how relationships change. And you think about how almost everyone you love was was once a stranger, you know, everyone you ha have a fight with an argument with was also once a stranger. Um, and then how um, sometimes enemies can become friends. You know, that's happened to a lot of us. <laughs> and very often friends become enemies, like especially with relationships. You know, it's quite often the person we love most in the world, um, when we break up with them, become our greatest enemy and our greatest source of pain. So you go through that, that meditation on, on equanimity, and it helps to make your mind less biased. You know, we talk mm -hmm. a lot about bias mm -hmm. today. But this is, but how do you cultivate non-bias? Like this is, there's a lot of very practical aspects in the Lam Rim because there's so much talk about cultivating non-bias today. But this is a tried and true method to do mm -hmm. it, is actually to think about how relationships change. Um, and then, an, and then the um, uh, immeasurable joy, there are many different interpretations, but one is that people eventually perfect these qualities and you know, never experience suffering again, only happiness. Mm -hmm. So then if you're going to be equanimous, then you need to be able to love your enemy. So how do you do that? <laughs> well, the, there's, um, I mean, that's where you go through the med. This is where people get really, um, it's, it's the hardest place in the path for a lot of people because um, in Buddhism and also just common sense, you realize that everyone has the same needs, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of this meditation is you just think that everybody needs a place to live. Everybody needs food. Um, everybody needs to be loved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, nobody wants a bomb to fall on them. And you think that not just for the people you like, but the, the people you don't like, including like Vladimir Putin, for example. <laughs> Let's just take like well, one of the hardest examples. Um, and so you acknowledge you really it's very hard for a lot of us because when you look at that person, you see only only bad, right? Most of us. But you try to acknowledge yourself like, OK, that guy, he wants his country to be secure and safe. He wants his people to be prosperous. Um, right. And also he believes he believes that um, people shouldn't own things. You know, that's that's ni it's a nice aspect of communism is that. People shouldn't own things. It should belong to everybody. So all that's quite nice about Vladimir Putin. So his needs are reasonable. It's the strategy he's taking to get those needs that's utterly misguided of conducting a war, killing people, lying and oppressing his own people. And so that's how you can generate a, um, at least a feeling of neutrality. That's how you get to a feeling of neutrality, even for a Vladimir Putin or you know, choose the, the person you hate most in the world is realize they want the same thing. They really want the same things as all of us, but they have utterly misguided strategies to get them. And if that person were happy, like if Vladimir Putin were really happy, mm -hmm. he wouldn't do those things. So wish him to be happy, because he would call, call off the war immediately. Um, this, is, this is something, um, Matthew Ricard, someone once asked Matthew Ricard, who would you like to spend a day with? If you could just spend a day alone with anybody, who would it be? And he said, Vladimir Putin, <laughs> because he'd like to have a nice conversation with him uh -huh. and, and talk to him about, you know, the true causes of happiness and suffering. Oh, that's what he said? Yeah. That's very good. I think I like that. Although I'm afraid Vladimir Putin might not tolerate somebody who just wanted him to be happy. He would then complain. There's a funny story that... Uh, What's his name? McCall, I think his name is, who, uh, McAuliffe or something like that, who was the Russian ambassador, American ambassador to Russia, took Hillary to visit 
um, Putin a few years ago when Putin was more or less, when she was Secretary of State, so that would be during the Obama administration. And uh, Putin, and then he, the, the um, ambassador told Hillary, just let him talk and let's hear what his story is. So they tried to hang out with him for a day, but all he did was complain. Yeah. Out in front of his, his, uh, um, they didn't know how to interrupt his complaining, you know, about how America this and America that. So she didn't somehow feel there was a way to get past that. But maybe she could, maybe she should have or could have. If she, if she had this book and read, and read him about, let's sit down and meditate on how to be happy. <laughs> Maybe so, but he's bent on, unless I own Ukraine or unless we have the Soviet Union back, I can't be happy, right? Yeah, that's so, attachment. But on the other hand, if you love him, then you think, well, would that really make him happy? Mm. No, because Soviet Union only had Western Europe, Eastern Europe. I mean, they didn't have West Germany, they didn't have the rest of Europe. So he would want that then, once yeah. he had the Eastern yeah. Europe. So he, to make him really happy, I've always had a fantasy of having a kind of paradise island for dic ex-dictators. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And how would you make them happy? What would you do? And um, there is the one instance, the only thing I can ever think of is uh, apparently when um, Mrs. Aquino was there with the yellow ribbons and yellow flowers, and they were they were tying up in the streets of Manila and this and that, and they were protesting Marcos. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I heard, I don't know if it's true, but I never researched it, but <clears throat> apparently Reagan was very intolerant of those protesters. And he said to send a message to Fernando to just wipe them out, you know. But then somebody in his administration said, no, Mr. President, that wouldn't be a good idea. Why don't we also offer him a trip to Hawaii? <laughs> So they sent planes, and they actually they had did. a whole plane for Amelda's shoes yeah. and her dresses and her all her things, you know. And they did fly them to Oahu to a mansion there and settle them there. But I, I guess Fernando probably wasn't. They didn't probably have a program of how to make Fernando happy. Mm. But she was she was happy, I think. Yeah. So she told him, to, "Let's go. It's more fun to go." <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this is a big misunderstanding, right? That loving your enemy. We think loving your enemy, which, you know, Jesus said, uh, means thinking they're a great person and just thinking they're we wonderful. Think we, we think we think lo we think loving our enemy means thinking our enemy is a great person. Oh, yeah. Right. We th but that's not it. Loving your enemy means wanting them to be genuinely happy, just really wishing for yeah. that, because they would be a much better person if they would happy. Yeah. Well the, well, the key point about it that makes it practical advice, everybody thinks Jesus was crazy saying that, and so was Buddha, you know, that that's hopeless. But actually, the key point is, your enemy is your enemy because he thinks you're in his way. Yeah. Like, I have a new thing for MAGA, what MAGA is secretly Vladimir Putin's slogan. But in his case, what it means is, make America go away. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, so the point is, if he was happy without bothering America to go away, then he wouldn't be, he wouldn't feel America's preventing his happiness. Yeah. So then, then he wouldn't be your enemy. So in other words, you wouldn't have an enemy. He'd be happy without destroying you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And uh, I guess uh, um, it's not practical to think because you're only one of you. So if you have many enemies, only one of them can destroy you, so then the other ones won't be happy. So there must be another method, you know. Yeah. But wishing them for to be happy, I think even if you oppose your enemy, but you do it lovingly in the sense of as a way of helping them find satisfaction in something, then, uh, then uh, they might sense that you, didn't, you weren't opposing them out of hatred. Yeah. You were opposing them. Like, for example, before... W invaded Iraq. I was really impressed with the protests, which the media, of course, didn't show us very much because they were, they were beating the war drums at the time. But they did occasionally show us. And what I loved about the there were marches in London that I remember particularly, and some in Washington. The one in Washington, they kind of broke it up and didn't let them go as a matter. But people would take the baby in a carriage in the perambulator and they had balloons and they were 
having a cheery time mm -hmm. about protesting. You know, in other words, they weren't like angrily saying, you know, uh, you know, kill, kill W. You know, they mm -hmm. were just saying, don't go killing those people. Don't invade that country. So I think that's a that's a secret. I think. I think that that uh, although they didn't, they ignored the protests. The idea that the protesters were still trying to be happy doing it, not doing it out of hatred and rage and anger, I think is very important. Yeah, and that's what the Buddha said, right? Like hatred is never ceased by hatred. Hatred yeah. is only ceased the by the Buddha love. and Jesus and yeah. a lot of people. This is an eternal law, you know, and we're forgetting that right now on on all sides. Um, yes. That, but really but it's because we don't know the definition of love. We think love means. Thinking our our enemy is is someone great. liking them, yeah, yeah they're liking cute. them. That's right. Yeah, right. it's actually just wanting them to have a clearer mind, yes. a better sense of the causes of happiness and suffering, and have happiness themselves, so they'll stop bothering everyone else. Yes. Well, they, in the in the West, they make the big difference between eros and agape, mm -hmm. and uh, but the Buddhist one is more like agape. Yeah. yeah. Although on the other hand, they say that um, when you really meditate love about beings, if you sit and meditate about love, they're yidong way jamba, they call it, you know. For example, in the sevenfold method in the mm -hmm. Lamrim about that, they say it's the pleasant love. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking of beings being happy, you think of them, you visual, you imagine them being happy. And then, you, and then when you do, and you imagine someone you know as being really happy, they will look beautiful to you yeah. meditatively. They'll look agreeable and pleasant to you. So, so that's a really good thing. And I think the transition from the love to the compassion is where then you're fantasizing the beings as being really happy and you meditate. But then compassion is when you notice they're not that happy. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Then, and then you, you know, karuna has a, has a etymology of uh, the na is a negation and karu means the, like a, a well-being in your heart. So you lose your own well-being because you notice someone else is miserable. Yeah. And so you blo it blocks your own agreeability, you feel, because you, you empathize with them. And uh, so that's why you then need to add joy to the mix. Yeah. And some, find some, something good about them. Yeah. And then the reason that's possible. So the Lamrim actually starts with a, pre a preamble, which I also start with, about the mind. Yes, because, it, because if you're going to train please, yeah. a happy mind, you have to know what a mind is. Oh, yes. And so one of the most beautiful aspects of Buddhism, a lot of people think Buddhism is just, oh, you know, life is suffering and then you die. Um, but one of the most beautiful aspects of Buddhism is that it says our mind is fundamentally good, that people are fundamentally good. And that's what, and that however dominant the delusions, anger, craving, selfishness, loneliness feel that they're at the surface they're just at the highest level of our of our consciousness and when you dive a little bit below which you can do in meditation like all the time if you, if you train in it enough you realize that first of all that your own mind is fundamentally good that underneath all that stuff is shallow it's conditioned you learned it from around you but it's not intrinsic that our intrinsic nature mm -hmm. is fundamentally kind loving patient joyful open um, and that's how you generate that love, right? Like, that's why you start with that in the Lam Rim, is so eventually that's, that's kind of the proof that people are lovable and that they can mm -hmm. change, is to see that and to feel that fundamental goodness, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Well, of course, the, His Holiness likes the one where you imagine other people was wanting to be happy just like you want to be happy. Yeah. yeah. Right, he, he prefers that to... Visualize all beings as your mother. <laughs> yeah, difficult. <laughs> he used to say. I think he kind of likes that now. He always says his greatest guru of compassion was his mother. He always says that. You know, he has he loves his of course other gurus about all the things that they taught him. Madeline Ramache and so on. But he he says his great guru of compassion was his mother. Yeah. He always says that. We have a lot more trouble with our mothers. What that? We have a lot more trouble with our mothers in, in our culture. So to generate love, sadly, to generate love, we often have to think of something other than our mothers, um, which is actually really unfair. Like, even if you had great difficulties with your mother, like I have, um, 
still how many 10,000 times did she feed me and change diapers and so it's it's quite sad <laughs> that I don't think about all that infinite kindness and I just think of a few little you know arguments and things that yeah. we've had that's mm. true so um, maybe some of you all have some questions yeah. do you have any questions about from Scott does anybody have questions we can I think do that we can certainly take take some questions and then are you going to you sign books? Yeah, anybody who wants, we can sign. Where, do we have some Oh, books? there's a question. If some people might like to get a yeah. book, you can have Scott sign it. I'm going to have him sign mine. <laughs> but first of all, does anybody have questions? Any questions? Yeah, right in back. Oh, good. There's a question there. Good. I Please speak loudly, so. Sure. Uh, how did you um, get in touch with or come to the attention of uh, the Dalai Lama to um, uh, uh, get them on in the, when you were making the book, right? So the book the book has a forward by His Holiness, yeah. And so Scott is is asking um, how did that happen? Uh -huh. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama is one of my teachers, but I don't get to like I don't get like Bob to come visit him directly and have him no, give me no, a big no. hug and a kiss and so on. Um, I'm in a big room with him, and I've taken many many like dozens of teachings with him. So the, what happened was um, my brother uh, actually told me, I think in a little bit of a, a kind of, you know, a careful way, he said, oh, you should really check with His Holiness about your book, <laughs> you know, and make sure I've had friends who wrote books and, you know, maybe ask him about this. And, you know, maybe he'll write a forward. And I thought, oh, you know, that's a good idea. So I found out how to do it. And even if you have many connections or something, you're supposed to go through a very formal process, which we did. My editor sent a final version of the book to His Holiness, to a specific email you're supposed to send it to. To his office. Yeah. To his office. And so we waited and waited, and six months went by. But I guess we got ghosted by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't hear anything. And we were about to go, we were two days from going to press. Then we got an email back from um, Geshe Nawang Sonam, who you probably know, one of the, His Holiness's translator. And he said, His Holiness would like to write a forward. He thinks this book is beneficial, and we have a few corrections for you, <laughs> which was great. So he helped, um, and it's surprising the things he had no, um, he had no uh, objections to many of the more radical aspects of the book, like doing Precious Life in a totally, you know, cosmological, mm -hmm. practical way. <clears throat> I even in the book, I even say, you know. At one point, I say Jerry Seinfeld gave as good of teaching on suffering as His Holiness did, you know, in one of his his, his monologues. No problems with that. But he did have pro and read that part. There's a great there's a great um, special on Netflix where Jerry Seinfeld talks about the suffering of change. But they had corrections to very very subtle aspects of the last topic on the nature ultimate nature of reality. Oh really? And and so what so what I have done is that we learn about. Um, more, more and more subtle ways of understanding the interdependent nature of reality, you know, that nothing is disconnected from anything else. And what we're normally taught is for beginners to use a coarser way of explaining interdependence. So like to say that, well, everything's made out of atoms or everything's made out of moments of consciousness. But in our tradition, there's this, you know, the words for it are prasangika, madhyamaka, like the middle way. Mm -hmm. philosophy which is um much more subtle because it 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 looks at reality and it says you can never find it like all you have is the mind and causes bringing things together and then parts that we sort of um that we see temporarily as a whole as a person or as a building or, or as a country and they really wanted me to use the madhyamaka um, view of emptiness and meditation on emptiness mm -hmm. so i corrected that part <laughs> yeah. Oh, you mean the, some of the questions had to do with the, the yoga chara? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I he, see the mind over yeah. school. So I corrected, and for each of them, I had I gave a reference back. They wanted to see the corrections too before writing the forward. So I made all the corrections, sent it back, and they said okay. And, and His Holiness wrote up. Really, forward. they asked you to correct and send it, send the yeah. correction. And then the the forward That's is marvelous. the forward is nice because His Holiness says how you know t Tibetan Tibet offers not just religion but also science and philosophy yeah and that the, the book helps to to round out the picture of what tibetan ancient tibetan culture yes, yes. has to offer western civilization 
Yeah, His Holiness and I had a conversation many years ago in one car, doing one car ride, where we, we try, I got, I lucked out and got into into the limo with him for a lo for a rather long ride. And uh, we, I got him to kind of agree that Buddhism is one sixth religion mm. and five sixths ethics and science uh, rather than just, and religion, of course, defined in the way modern social science defines religion, which is a belief system. And so rather it's an open mind system, but at some point, and however, there can be a cultivating a positive attitude without being sure of what you're having a positive attitude about. And so that can be religion, like a, 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 a an elegant belief or a potential yeah. one that you don't have full evidence for. Yeah. And uh, so that's why we allowed that to be one sixth. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there's the three educations, education in ethics, education in mind, and education in wisdom. And the ethics and wisdom, that's two thirds. And that's not at all, not, none of those are religious. The wisdom is purely skeptical, investigating, analyzing, and so on, and discovering reality, what it is. And ethics are bathing yourself in a, in a commonsensically, yeah. obviously good way. And then the mind part, there's critical meditation that is just an analytical, that takes things apart. And then there's some po cultivating a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the one sixth is. It's half of that third, where you just th you're thematically cultivating, uh, 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 making yourself see things a certain way yeah. because that's positive. You have reasons to think that's positive, but it isn't just uh, you know it's not open. You're you're going insisting on the positive, something like that. So that's yeah. really that's that's one the one sixth religion. No, it's very important, and that's also in the preamble to the book. What? That's also in the preamble to the book is talking about. The ethics being at the foundation of Buddhist practice, oh, yeah. and then I use um, Alan Wallace gave a good um, definition of ethics from a Buddhist perspective. The three parts, which you'll recognize immediately, first principle of ethics is nonviolence, yes. <laughs> which definitely makes you kind of pause and maybe slump, you know, for the yeah. the lack of that in our society and even in our own minds. The second one is kindness, you know, or benevolence, kindness. Uh -huh. Then, then the third one is understanding your mind. So very few people, you know, it's com not he coming. That, he put that with ethics. Yeah, ethics. like because you, you'd say, you know, um, uh, nonviolence, benevolence, and understanding your mind. Nonviolence, really? kindness, understanding. Why does he think that in ethics? That would be more like wisdom, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because, but the nonviolence is more subtle. It, one yeah. thing that's important that I, I'm very concerned about nowadays since I am very proud of the Ukrainians myself. Yeah. And um, for years in academic conferences, I went around saying, Buddhism has no holy war theory, Buddhism is all nonviolence, blah, blah, blah. And uh, annoying some of my Western colleagues. And then I discovered the sutra called the range of the Bodhisattva, where uh, the Buddha uh, is in a conversation with a Jain uh, Bodhisattva actually who is very highly a sage, you know, and um, they discuss the situation of being invaded by a neighboring king. If you, if, you, if you were a king, if you were responsible for a society and you're invaded, then what do you do? And, and, the, and the Jain guy and the Buddha agree that if you have the means to resist that invader and expel him, you should. But, and then you don't pursue them into their country, and you, but you impose like a kind of treaty or something and make sure they don't do it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's because that lessens the violence of them dominating you and maybe destroying your people, taking over, just kick, killing your people. And like, like the Europeans killed all the native people or yeah. nine tenths of them. And so that's make then that's surrender then is worse violence. But if you don't have the means to expel them, if they're much more powerful than you, you do you do surrender and you don't resist because if you resist in a suicidal way a you die resisting you do kill some of them on the way then they're more angry and they're more vicious in the way they dominate you so that that does not minimize violence in other words so and that's the normally the way people understand nonviolence is come destroy come kill me or come run over me with your tank but actually, it's not really good for the person who runs over you in the tank. Mm -hmm. They make this point in this discussion they have. 
So someday if you could stop that tank and have them just drive it back over there and, and not bother you with it or, or whatever, then that's, that's necessary to do. And, um, you know, the, nobody believes Tibet, they do think of Tibet as a lost cause because it, although the Tibetans did resist when the Chinese invaded them in the 1950s, some Tibetans in Eastern Tibet did resist. And the Dalai Lama did not ask the nation to rise because he felt it was hopeless. He let them, so they, they, no, the, the, the parliament wanted to resist at first, and then they immediately lost because they had old-fashioned matchlock guns and things against a battle-hardened Chinese Red Army, and immediately lost everything. Actually, one of the, the leaders surrendered immediately because he realized he couldn't do anything. And so that, so that was his approach. And ideally, everyone should be able to do like that. But in the case of the Ukrainians, they've experienced being dominated by the Russians, and it has been genocidal on them. Yeah. And there is an attempt to make them Russian, you know. And so I'm proud of them, I thought. Also, there is an Ukraine house here in New York mm -hmm. from the 50s, was the gift or the major leader of that time was Jack Palance. And some <laughs> of you who are older might remember who that was. He was a Ukrainian. So he gave a Ukraine house to show they had an independent culture. Yeah. So this Tibet house here and this Buddhist temple, we're in a Buddhist temple inside the insides of the Altshi temple here. And that's sort of to be a kind of destination place, as humble as it may be, where people can realize there is something called the Tibetan people, <laughs> which is not, a, you know, in, in world diplomacy, there's no such thing as Tibet. It's just China's, a variety of Chinese. Yeah. They could try to claim, but that is, of course, a lie. Yeah. And, uh, and therefore, they are currently still, after 70 years, they're still trying to assimilate the Tibetans yeah. or destroy them, yeah, it's which is very genocide. sad. You know? And it's our job to try to keep people alive, keep the Tibetans alive in the mind of the world, mm. so they will. So the Chinese might think twice about actually fin finishing doing the final solution there. Although they are working on the final solution still. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. Destroying the culture. Terrible. So okay. Any uh, any other question? Yes. Okay. You have a question. You get the mic. Mm -hmm. uh. Uh, thanks so much for this and for the book. Uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it, and you know, yeah, I it underlined so much of it and you know, read it to myself. With, to continue the uh, matrix analogy a little bit, and plus because you have a quote by Keanu Reeves, which I feel like <laughs> makes it like especially. I was like, yeah. whoa! In case you forgot that matrix bit, there's actually a Keanu Reeves quote yeah. in there. I feel like a lot of people would take the red pill if it were just a pill, you know? Yeah. And I, the, the issue with a lot, I'm mean, not the issue, but, you know, just being a, a cynic, pragmatist, skeptic, yeah. whatever best word we're using, is I feel like a lot of the, uh, the prescriptions, which make so much sense and are so logical, are often these, like, regimens of pills mm. where you're like, take this pill in the morning every day for 30 mm. days or 60 days, and then you'll have these realizations of what you were describing, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think the thing that's so attractive to the Western mind, perhaps, in this kind of push-button world and, you know, in the kind of like there's a pill for everything is like, you know, and with this whole new culture of psychedelic everything where, you know, you'll have, you'll trip out and you have this insight yeah. or these moments of, you know, stark awakening, sudden yeah. awakening, these epiphanic kind of moments, you know. I don't even know if that's the right adjectival form of epiphany or whatever. But... And I'm wondering if in your, in like either of you, I mean, please, like if there's like a practice that is sort of these sorts of like the orchestration of it, because sometimes you see these things in the books, like there are these dense mm. texts on the Mahamudra. And in the beginning, they'll start out by saying, you know, at one point people used to get sung into enlightenment and you're like, whoa, what was that like? You know, you go <laughs> like, something like that seems a lot easier yeah. or even like uh, 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 the last, the Wisdom is Bliss, which Robert Thurman's book was, uh, yeah. you know, this kind of last chapter about his consolation prize where he's staring at the picture and then he has this kind of like eternal return of the same moment where you have this kind of, this moment where you have this transcendence. And I'm just wondering, like, mm -hmm. if anyone's ever compiled all these exercises yeah. for these like transcendent awakenings. Well, there's, there's no, there's no instant well, for some people it does happen instantly and there, there are stories of that and experiences that people have. In general, you know, like His Holiness says, um, I see, he says, I, I see my mind change over the course of 
five years, you know. But there really are immediate benefits to benefit to meditation. Let me tell you something practical. My my teacher, Venerable Rabina, she once said she said recently in a teaching, she said, no one has ever come to me and said, I can't stop thinking happy thoughts. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so like that's what that's what these these exercises are is a way to gradually steer your mind to constructive ways of thinking. And it's not Pollyanna-ish, like everything's great, the wars will end tomorrow. It's time-tested thoughts that you can have as you're walking down the street when you wake up in the morning that actually steer your mind. Happiness is not the best word, toward, let's say towards satisfaction, to feeling like your life is meaningful and satisfying and purposeful. We all want to feel that way. And it is some effort to, to, to think these things. But the thing is, if you make them, if you make them tasty, like I tried to make the ideas in here tasty the way they, that my <laughs> teachers made them for me, um, then you naturally think about them all the time. Like I remember the first time I ever got the teaching on interdependence was in a book by Thich Nhat Hanh. And it was just in one sentence where he said, you are only made of non-you elements. He didn't say it was emptiness, interdependence, everything. And I've been thinking about that almost, you know, every day since. Like, wow, you look at, you think, I'm only, and, and in a talk like this, it's nice to mention, even though it's a little scary with COVID, is that we have all actually taken in each other. So I, you've all literally become me and Bob, and I've literally become you. We've taken in parts of your body, parts of yourselves, you've taken in us. We'll literally leave with little parts of each other both our bodies, literally, like our cells and our breath, but also our minds. We've like your ideas just got into me, and I'll, a little part of you will be with me for the rest of my life from your question. And likewise, our talk right now. The more you can cultivate the, they say, the more you can cultivate constructive thoughts like that, the the negative ones, disturbing ones, just naturally disappear because they're just not intrinsic to you. These type of thoughts, the reason they feel tasty is they're natural. They they they're coherent with reality and, and that's why they feel good. So it is work. It does take work, but if you can find a way that it, the ones that resonate with your mind and our culture um, in your own ways, um, sometimes recording them in your own voice, like read it to yourself, you know, and, and listen to it on your headphones. It's worthwhile. And, you know, it has worked for many, many, no guarantee, obviously, and definitely no guarantee of it in any instant epiphany. But ask anybody who's followed this path for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, and in general, you know, they've had some beneficial result. Yes, I do think you should, you could, in another edition, you could put a picture of your own smiling face <laughs> on here. I think it'd be very good. It'd definitely help your mind. Yeah, like so thank you so much. Um, uh, I really, really, you made me happy by coming and writing this book and, and having this happy conversation. I really think it's really quite nice. You did mention Keanu Reeves, and I was shocked the other day when I heard Keanu Reeves dishing out the three refuges. Oh yeah, yeah. On Instagram. Oh yeah, he's a. He, he's like in, 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 introducing the Dharma. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's really quite nice. He played Buddha in a movie, in the Bertolucci movie, The Little Lama, yeah. and um, and then uh, finally now he's uh, he's teaching yeah. refuge. Yeah. I think that's adorable. In between killing everybody in that other movie, <laughs> in those other movies, he's like teaching refuge. I think that's quite nice, really. I do. Yeah. He's a lovely person, I think, really. Excellent. Thanks. Well, so you, thank you so much for this, anyway. Thank you. And now, thank if anybody, where's the books? Or uh, does, uh, what about the books? Do we have some books somewhere? Did people, did anybody get any books? They, they want to yeah, sign them. I got one. No, there's books in the front if you didn't. I want, to sign, I want to sign one. So you, you want to sit of here? Of course. Yeah, sure. I can just sit here. So listen, can you yeah, sign my if book? anyone wants it, I'll you definitely sign you. you so, so just so you know, Bob, I quote Bob in probably a dozen times in this book. It's um, He's an extraordinary inspiration and such a creative um, force. So very, very creative in the way you teach the Dharma and, you know, rephrase oh, no. incredible words and, and phrases. So there's a lot of Bob in this, in this book. He, his, his was the first book I ever read about Buddhism. The, the, the Tibetan, the, your, your translation of, you know, the Tibetan book of living and dying, because my best friend's father died, who was a oh, big major, he yeah, was a major, a mentor book of to natural me. Natural liberation. Natural liberation. By learning in the between. Yeah. There's no dead people, is the key thing about that. Yeah, one of Bob's great phrases from that book is, there's no dead people. Sounds like something <laughs> from the sixth sense or something. 
Um, but yeah, I was very inspired by that book because my, my, someone I really loved and admired died. And then I started searching bookshelves to try to understand death. And I found Bob's book, which is the first book on Buddhism I read in 1994. Yeah, so thank you. That is my bestseller. Yeah. Slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank slowly, you. Slowly. Slowly. It's such a captive market. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Everybody thinks they're dying and nobody gets to.